Good morning, everyone, and welcome to HBCU Week. I am thrilled to be able to kick off this year's conference with two phenomenal leaders, Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona, who's my boss, and White House Senior Advisor Representative Cedric Richmond. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to share this virtual stage with you. And it is also a pleasure to meet with our virtual audience, having the opportunity to be here and to, to kick off HBCU week and to work at the Department of Education in many ways is a dream come true. And it allows me to fulfill one of my personal commitments, which is to support, uplift, and give back to the communities that have supported me. And HBCU certainly fit into that category. I grew up on HBCU campuses. My father was a proud graduate of South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. And in the years following his graduation, South Carolina State became more than just his alma mater. It became part of our family life, and in many ways it still is. So this work in support of HBCU students, graduates, and institutions is personal because I can witness to how it has shaped my family and how the institutions have been a real anchor in my community. There are many exciting moments that you are going to witness during this week's conference. One is the unveiling of the new White House executive order focused on advancing educational equity, excellence, and economic opportunity through historically black colleges and universities. This executive order was signed by President Biden on Friday, and you will hear lots more about it throughout the conference beginning with this discussion this morning. Representative Richmond, Secretary Cardona, both of you have very, very, very impressive bios, and we could actually spend the entire morning just talking about the many ways both of you have supported Black students and HBCUs throughout your career. You are certainly true champions. But instead of me telling the audience about your work, I'm actually going to turn it over to you and ask them, I ask you to tell them in your own words uh, about what it is you do, what it is the administration has been doing, and how your offices are really working to uplift our historically black colleges and universities. And then after we do that, with some kick, start off with some kickoff conversation and discussion. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience for their Q&A. So with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Cedric Richmond. Well, Michelle, let me just uh, thank you and I won't uh, talk too long. People want to hear from education experts, not the guy just sitting in the White House. But I will say this, uh, as a uh, son of a mother and father who both went to HBCUs and uh, my grandparents had uh, doctorate degrees from HBCUs. It runs through our family. Uh, both my brother and I graduated from Morehouse College in Atlanta, and there's a very unique role uh, that HBCUs play in this country and uh, that they play for the country. In terms of producing the best and the brightest in areas, uh, if we're talking about education, if we're talking about medicine, all of STEM, uh, HBCUs are continuing to educate and do wonders with uh, the black community and the, their student population. And what I've found from my experience is that uh, HBCUs are vested in their students. And it's not just about keeping a full population of students at a school. It's about investing into those students, making sure that those students can continue to uh, be leaders in society, continue to provide for families, create generational change and do all of the things that are uh, necessary and that uh, we want. And so when we talk about the American dream, you have to talk about HBCUs as one of the best avenues to achieve that. And so this administration, <clears throat> as we focused on equity and inclusion, and we have a whole of government uh, task on that, making sure we utilize black businesses, uh, that we step up in the education arena. <clears throat> and if you look at our assistance so far in terms of uh, help to HBCUs and either loan forgiveness or direct cash payments, it's been monumental and historic. And I know that the secretary is going to talk about that. But 
the general sense of what we want to convey from the White House is that uh, we know the importance of HBCUs. We're going to support uh, HBCUs and we're going to make sure that they can continue to thrive and do the, the hard work uh, that has to be done. And we all don't talk about it. And I'm sure the secretary knows it uh, probably better than I do. <clears throat> but I've watched it for years in New Orleans, which had a failing public school system. And what HBCUs are able to do is take those kids out of uh, public school systems from around the country who have uh, did their best, but their best just wasn't good enough. And HBCUs take those students, raises the bar, uh, and the end product is something that is amazing. And so we have to understand uh, not only the output from HBCUs, but the input that uh, they get, uh, the product that they get when they get there and the product that they put out. And when you look at it in that sense, uh, it is uh, a monumental achievement what our HBCUs and the presidents and staff and faculty have been able to do. So I just want to thank you and I think I'll shoot it back to you, Michelle. Uh, but thanks a lot and the White House stands behind you. We are so delighted to know that we have colleagues in the White House who recognize that this is not just an important issue for the institutions, but for our nation and our country. And we're so delighted to have you here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Richmond. Secretary Cardona. Thank you. Good morning and uh, happy HBCU week. What a special week. Uh, thank you for joining uh, my colleague from White House and Morehouse College alum, uh, Cedric Richmond, and me for this conversation moderated by my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Michelle Asha Cooper, uh, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary for Post Secretary, uh, Post Secondary Education. I love your passion and your leadership, Michelle. Thank you. I also want to uh, thank the staff from the White House Initiative, um, HBCUs for their extraordinary work in planning this conference. Less than a month ago, we were hoping to do this in person, uh, but met, many things quickly adapting. Um, we wanted to, we moved it virtual to make sure it was safe for everyone. But I do look forward to uh, connecting in person in the future when it's safer. I also want to take a moment to thank the dedicated career staff at the Department of Education Seneca Franklin and team uh, for the commitment uh, to this important work over the years. I'm thrilled to be joining you all from Lincoln University, one of the nation's first degree granting historically black colleges and universities. It's a fitting place to kick off this year's HBCU week conference. You might have heard some cheering in the background. I'm in the conference room right next door uh, to the room where Lincoln University President Brenda Allen and Lincoln uh, uh, Chair, Board Chair Gerald Bruce are sitting and their teams are sitting. They're right next door to me. Um, I'm proudly wearing my uh, Lincoln University pin and I'm so glad to be here where students learn, liberate and lead. The past year and a half has been incredibly difficult for everyone. Uh, before we go any further, I want to say thank you to all of you that are listening for what you've been able to do this last year and a half, bending over backwards, adapting, shifting to make sure that the students needs are being taken care of first. Um, I know that was no easy task, so I just want to start off by saying thank you. There was no playbook on this and you adapted beautifully and you serve students. Um, so thank you for the work you've done. Uh, we know HBCUs play a, a vital role, role in providing educational opportunity, scholarly growth and a sense of community for our students. I met students from the uh, Student Government Association and the uh, football team when I when I landed on campus a little while ago. And um, the sense of community was clear. They were happy to be back. And thank you for everything you've done to get them back. HBCUs educate a greater percentage of lower income Pell ed eligible students while receiving less revenue from tuition and possessing much smaller endowments uh, than comparable non HBCU institutions. Disparities in resources and opportunities for HBCUs and their students remain and must be addressed. And the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted continuing in new challenges. Together, we must unapologetically address access and opportunity gaps made worse by the pandemic. I'm proud of the work of the department and what they've done over the last eight months to forgive $1.6 billion in debt to HBCUs that participate in the capital financing program, providing two point, another $2.6 billion in additional funding to HBCUs through the American Rescue Plan 
and aid HBCUs in spending more than $5 billion in emergency funds to safely reopen campus and support students. But as we protect against the spread of COVID, we also protect against complacency as well. Clearly, there's still much work we have to do together. As you heard from the president and in his proclamation for HBCU week, he is fully committed to HBCUs and your students. He's proposed approximately $239 million in new institutional aid funding for HBCUs in the Department of Education's budget for the next school uh, next year, including $72 million in new discretionary funding for HBCUs. In addition, he's proposed approximately $167 million in new mandatory funding for HBCUs and wants to offer two years of subsidized tuition and expand programs in high demand fields. I'm excited to support the relaunched White House initiative on HBCUs at the Department excellence and economic opportunity. The president has expressed his deep commitment to HBCUs, and I know that Congressman Richmond and all other senior leaders at the White House are dedicated to ensuring that this is the most robust and ambitious White House initiative ever. You'll see consistent direct engagement from across the executive office of the president and throughout the entire executive branch. As Cedric mentioned, this is a whole of government approach. We're all in this together to support HBCUs. President Biden will soon announce the next chair for the HBCU Board of Advisors and new members. And I intend to work closely with them to ensure that the voices of HBCUs are well represented within the administration. I'll also look forward to working with the new executive director of the White House Initiative on HBCUs when that position is filled and have been greatly impressed by the strong civil servants who've been working on the initiative over the past several administrations. We look forward to working with all of you to continue to support HBCUs in a way that will allow these invaluable institutions and our country to build that better. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Secretary Cardona. Thank you so much. And also, I want to just add to your thanks to Lincoln University. Um, I have had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Allen, Lincoln's president, and she is a real leader in doing some great things at Lincoln. So thank you, Dr. Allen, and thank you, Lincoln University, for being the host uh, for the Secretary's kickoff. Now we have some questions that have already been coming in from our audience, and I want to go straight to those questions. So the first one is for you, Mr. Richmond. It is from a student, um, an HBCU scholar from Southern University Law Center, Idris, Idris Stagg. And uh, Mr. Stagg, if I pronounce your name incorrectly, please forgive me. Um, but I do have your question and the question is one of the reasons that I decided to go to law school is because of the lack of knowledge and trust in my community as it pertains to the law and government. How does the Biden administration plan to help to build trust in law and government within the African American community? Well, Mr. Stagg, let me first of all say that uh, it's a great question. Uh, you represent a great university that I was proud to represent in Congress for the last 10 years, and that was crazy enough to give me an honorary degree. So uh, let me just acknowledge then, as I said before, my mother and father both went to Southern. Here's what we have to do. First of all, we have to restore people's faith in government, and that comes from one, being honest to people, uh, that's telling them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. That's making sure that they know that they're seen and that they're heard and that we're listening. And lastly, to make sure that we are delivering to meet needs and challenges. And so here are some examples on the government side, and then I'll talk about the uh, criminal justice side or just the justice system side, put it that way. But so if you look at <clears throat> our COVID response of getting uh, you know, purchasing enough shots for all 300 million people to get two doses, pushing it, being honest with people where, uh, you know, just giving them the honest science, but making sure that we uh, delivered on unemployment, that we had eviction moratoriums, that we did things to make people know that we knew the circumstances in which they were living and we were going to try to help people. So if you look at the $2,000 total in terms of direct payments, all of that is to show people we can meet the needs. So if you look at the latest, which would relate to you is Hurricane Ida response and making sure that one, people understand that when you get knocked down, 
and it's beyond your capacity to get back up, that the federal government will be there to lend you a hand and get back up. And that's what we should do as government is deliver and protect people. And that's what we're going to do in Louisiana. That's what we're going to do in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. And then on the justice system side, uh, you've never heard a president talk about systemic racism in his inaugural address and before a joint session of Congress to say that we're going to root out racism within government wherever we see it. And we have <clears throat> uh, Susan Rice over the Domestic Policy Council uh, overseeing a whole of government uh, racial equity uh, model and, and initiative. And so we are every from uh, education to housing to the justice system. And if you look at our Department of Justice, we uh, we just appointed Kristen Clark and Vanita Gupta in the Department of Justice. Both of them ran left civil rights organizations. So it one, I don't think we can do it by talking about it. We have to do it about we have to do it by showing people we're serious. So if you look at the the pattern and practice investigations that we've launched into police departments that show uh, racial bias and how they police. Or if you look at the lawsuits that we've uh, filed against, uh, or the charges that we've brought against officers who have used excessive force and violated people's civil rights. So we're going to continue to do that. But the short answer is to keep showing people that you get it, you understand, and you're not afraid to tackle those rough issues. And I think that that's exactly what we're doing and we're going to keep doing it. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is going to be for Secretary Cardona. Um, numerous students and administrators have submitted questions regarding what the administration will do to make college affordable, noting the disparities in the amount of debt that black students take on as compared to their white counterparts. And really, we want to get a sense of what are we doing at the Department of Education? And if you could also talk about some of the steps toward debt forgiveness and public service loan forgiveness. What are we doing? What else can we do to make sure we're helping our black students? Thank you very much, Michelle. And you know, th this is really important. It's personal to me. Um, we unfortunately still have a system where many students don't even think about college because of the fear of the costs. And um, as a first generation college student myself, uh, this is one that I, 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 it resonates with me and as Secretary of Education, we're going to do everything in my power to help support our students. And a lot of attention is given to uh, broad debt relief. And while we're still having conversations about what, where that will end up, I, I want folks to know we're not waiting for that. There's a lot we can do and there's a lot that has been done and there's a lot that's being proposed. And I'll share a little bit of that with you. but. I'll start off by saying that in the last six, seven months, I've spoken to many uh, borrowers um, and have heard their stories specifically. Um, and um, without question, students, um, black students' stories are really impactful. We know black students owe nearly twice as much uh, than their white counterparts um, four years after graduation. And then that gap worsens over time, which means student loan debt is a contributor to the racial wealth gap. We know that. Since day one, uh, the Biden administration has worked to deliver relief uh, for borrowers. These steps have uh, provided from since January to now $9.5 billion in discharges to over 560,000 borrowers. Um, that's significant. Many more uh, have benefited from the extended student loan payment pause, which is now into next year. Um, but we recognize that's not enough. At the agency, we're prioritizing uh, making sure the public service loan forgiveness works the way it was intended to work. We're going to double down on borrower defense. We're doing everything in our power to keep the students at the center of the conversation. And the president has proposed uh, significant um, uh, strategies to also improve um, as well. So two years of sub, uh, subsidized tuition for students from families making less than 125,000 a year and attend an HBCU or other uh, MSI. Um, $1,875 proposal increase to Pell, which is significant. Um, community College for All, which would help those 11 HBCUs that are also community colleges. And a $62 billion investment in college completion grants uh, to invest in those wraparound services that we know our students need, especially after the pandemic. Um, and also an increase to Title III funding by $247 million to a total of $886.8 million for HBCUs. 
So at the end of the day, we're, we're committed to making sure we're supporting all students, but in particular students from HBCUs who we know can benefit from the support, uh, targeted support, and um, we want to make sure that we're doing our part. We're going to continue the conversations around uh, loan uh, forgiveness, but from from day one till now, there's been uh, significant um, support for students who are uh, many of them HBCU students who are uh, in need of support. Thank you for that, Dr. Cardona. Um, the next question is from the provost at Payne College, and it's from Dr. Curtis Martin, um, and it's for Mr. Richmond. The question is, with the contributions of HBCUs to this country and the responsibility of government to ensure that Blacks and all citizens have the opportunity for middle class status and beyond, why does the federal government not assess the infrastructure needs of these institutions and provide support to prevent them from becoming the ghettos of a failed democracy without hope for revival nor a plan for what this country would do without them for a large group of minority citizens seeking to better themselves? Mr. Richmond. Well, I think it's a it's a good question, raises a, a valid point. Uh, I'm not sure that that's for this administration uh, to respond to, because I think that we've demonstrated our uh, in-depth knowledge of what HBCUs provide and the challenges that they face and the investments that they need. And so if you look at the 4.2 billion that the secretary talked about, and part of that is uh, capital finance debt forgiveness, or if you look at the proposed $239 million just for next year for HBCUs that we want to put out. And I think that 72 million of that is discretionary spending. So we understand it. And uh, if you look at other policies throughout government that actually uh, touch on HBCUs, research and other things, we want to make sure that we close the gap between well-resourced uh, universities and those that have traditionally been under-resourced. And we understand uh, you know, when you start looking at endowments, you start looking at funding and all of those, there is a uh, great divide and we want to uh, close that. But the other thing I would just say is that we recognize it, our HBCUs, uh, I think recognize it, but we just have to, one, from our level, uh, invest, put dollars and resources there. And from the institution's level, they have to uh, make a commitment uh, to double down on what they're doing in terms of their own fundraising and in terms of their commitment to academic excellence. And the last part of, about this, uh, just to highlight, because we put a lot of thought, energy and money into HBCUs is that a lot of times our HBCUs are also the catalyst for the community and they're the anchors of the community. And we have to make sure that we invest in the infrastructure in those infra institutions because it means so much to the neighborhood that they're in. So whether you're talking about a Morehouse College or a Southern University or Xavier or Dillard or any of uh, the schools, Clark Atlanta, you know, it's it's a hub for the university. I mean, for the community, the communities take great pride in it and we have to make sure that their infrastructure uh, is not lacking. But all of that is a uh, measure of the funding that can be provided and we get it and we're working on it. Thank you, thank you. I'm hoping we can get to maybe one or two more questions here. Um, the next one is from the president of Bowie State University, Dr. Bro, and uh, this is for Secretary Cardona. The question is, um, the areas of school counselor and our social worker should be on the list of high need fields for teach grants to not only address the issue of COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, in distance uh, learning, but also for school violence. We need more mental health professionals in schools in order to strengthen the safety net of young children and youth impacted by community violence. What are underway to strengthen the TEACH grants and to support greater development of teachers and essential mental professionals within our schools? That's a great question, Dr. Brew. Thank you. Uh, you know, as an educator, lifelong educator myself, I know that the social emotional well being of students is a prerequisite to high levels of learning. Um, it's almost like they're talk a lot about the digital divide, right? But the learning bandwidth for students is definitely impacted by um, their social emotional well being. And I don't have to tell the group that post pandemic, black and brown communities were impacted more by the pandemic. So as we reopen our schools, a lot of attention is being given to physical safety. 
I want as much attention to be focused on the emotional safety of not only our students, but our staff. So it's critically important that as we build back better, as we reopen our schools, we really are bold about making sure that social and emotional support for our students is part of the plan and that it's more than just an ancillary service when students are in, in desperate need. Um, so to that, um, you know, there are efforts underway with the not only the ARP, but the new executive order uh, requires the White House initiative to develop a pipeline of qualified and culturally responsive educators who could meet the social most. And I do believe um, school counselors and, and those should those hard to fill areas should be a focus as we reopen schools. So there is an attention on that in the executive order, uh, but the funding $400 million for uh, teacher quality partnership uh, grants to effectively prepare aspiring teachers and $60 million for the Augustus Hawkins Center for Excellence uh, Programming uh, to support teacher preparation programs at HBCUs and MSIs are critically important. You know, what, one of my biggest fears as we reopen schools, um, symptoms of trauma are interpreted as um, disciplinary, disciplinary issues and that our schools are going back the same way we did business before March 2020. That's a low bar. So the, the funding is there provide teacher training in the in the president's proposal budget proposal. There's uh, funds to provide better training for teachers, especially in those hard to uh, fill areas to make sure that when we're reopening our schools, we're investing in our educators and their capacity building to meet the needs of our students. And we know the needs of our students have been um, exacerbated uh, from an emotional and mental health standpoint. We need to be prepared to meet them. The budget does call on specific strategies to provide funds not only at the K-12 level, but at the higher education level to make sure that our teacher programs are, are adequate. All right, well, we are almost at time. And so I'm going to ask you all to offer a final closing statement, but I'm hoping that you can do that in response to one more question that I'm going to toss to both of you. It is from uh, Jordan Braithwaite. I'm an HBCU scholar at Grambling State University back towards your neck of the woods, Mr. Richmond. And um, I'm hoping that you can just offer a 45 second response to Jordan's question and wrap it into a closing statement. Uh, the question is, what would you say is the most rewarding but yet challenging part of your work dealing with priorities relating to HBCUs and how do you overcome those challenges that you may face? Thank you, Jordan. And look, I know you have some exceptional leadership at Gramlin with uh, Rick Gallo as your president, uh, former state senator and one of my roommates and I was in his wedding, so it shows you he doesn't have the best judgment in the world. But your your question is is very simple and it's about HBCUs, but it's really about the black community in general. And so that's why we look at it as a comprehensive approach of not only investing in HBCUs, but investing in the black community, investing in K through 12 education, adding two years at three and four years can go to school, not just daycare. Those are the types of things that we think will be a comprehensive solution to issues that the black community faces and HBCUs play a humongous role in addressing those challenges. So as we invest in HBCUs at historic levels, as we make sure that they're at the seat of the table in shaping policy, we're also going to invest in the black community. We think that that is the best way to do it both for HBCUs and the black community as a whole. So thank you for the question. And thank you uh, again. Thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm I'm excited about HBCU week. And what I will share is, I said it before. We have to be unapologetic about addressing the inequities that were exacerbated, and that includes to our students and in, in, uh, uh, institutions, HBCU institutions. So I, I look forward to that challenge, um, and I look forward to to learning and working with you to to make this happen. Um, I think you know one of the things we need to do is share best practices. I was. Uh, fortunate to, to be on campus at Howard University when they were doing a vaccine clinic. There's so much black excellence happening on these colleges that the world needs to see that. So I look forward to partnering with you, rolling up my sleeves to uh, solve whatever challenges there are, but also celebrating the excellence that are these HBCUs. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Secretary Cardona, for taking time out of your super busy schedules to be here. Also want to thank Lincoln University again for hosting you for this morning. And thank you for all of the individuals who have submitted questions. I, I really appreciate that. 
um, to all in our audience, despite the challenges of the global pandemic, you are continuing to strive for excellence and we all say thank you. thank you. I hope that you will stay tuned for our next session that will begin in a few short minutes featuring Dr. Anthony Fauci and Secretary Miguel Cardona. Thank you everyone. Hello everybody, my name is Rod Joy and I'm proud to serve as Chief of Staff at the National Endowment for the Arts. On behalf of all of us at the Arts Endowment, I'm very pleased to help welcome you to the annual National HBCU Week Conference. The Arts Endowment is committed to making sure that every student everywhere in America has access to the arts as part of a well-rounded education. Since 2005, the NEA has been a proud partner of Poetry Out Loud, a national arts education initiative that encourages high school students across the country to discover and celebrate poetry. By memorizing and reciting poems, students gain confidence and poise and develop an appreciation for the power that words can hold. Poetry Out Loud has directly reached more than 4.1 million students and counting. To help us celebrate the National HBCU Week Conference, it is now my honor to introduce Sequoia Gorham, 2021 Poetry Out Loud DC Champion and a sophomore at the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Sequoia, take it away. Songs for the People by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Let me make the songs for the people. Songs for the old and young, songs to stir like a battle cry wherever they are sung. Not for the clashing of sabers, for carnage, nor for strife, but to thrill the hearts of men with more abundant life. Let me make the songs for the weary amid life's fever and fret, till hearts shall relax their tension and careworn brows forget. Let me sing for little children, before their footsteps stray. Sweet anthems of love and duty to float over life's highway. I would sing for the poor and age when shadows dim their sight of bright and restful mansions where there shall be no night. Our world needs music, pure and strong, to hush the jangle and discords of sorrow, pain, and wrong. Music to soothe all its sorrows, till war and crime shall cease, and the hearts of men grown tender, girdle the world with peace.
Hello and welcome back for the second session of this morning's virtual conference con uh, proceedings. Hello, my name is Dr. Cameron Webb and I'm really pleased to join you to, to help moderate this really important discussion. This session number two is, is entitled Real Talk. It's really an opportunity for us to engage about the important work that HBCUs are doing in addressing COVID-19 at their institutions and in their communities, but also to answer any questions that you all have regarding reopening campuses and regarding this current and really difficult moment in the pandemic, which is you know, the spread of this Delta variant. Now, by background, I'm an internal medicine doctor and lawyer. I usually work at uh, the University of Virginia, but since January, I've been serving as a senior policy advisor for equity on the White House COVID-19 response team. And, and in that capacity, I've been able to see and work with both of these two esteemed panelists that are joining today. Uh, of course, they are leaders, not only in this administration, in this country, but in the world, really in, in helping to set the stage for how we can address a pandemic like this. So really a critical moment. Of course, you heard from Secretary Cardona just a minute ago in the panel with, uh, with Cedric Richmond, and, and that was focused you know, in one way, really addressing HBCUs more broadly. This second panel, uh, the secretary is going to be speaking a little bit more to the specific uh, issues and roles that HBCUs have been playing in fighting the pandemic. And, and also, I want to introduce uh, someone who also needs no introduction, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, of course, who's the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And he has actually been a leader in government for a long time uh, over at the NIH. Uh, he actually trained at the same place that I trained in New York City at Wild Cornell uh, Medicine, just a couple of years apart, Dr. Fauci. I think. Uh, but uh, but I think that uh, you know, it's really an exciting time for you all to have your questions answered. I know some of you pre-submitted some questions, and as the title of this session suggests, it's about real talk. It's just trying to shoot you straight, give you the best information that we can so that you can move forward as leaders and as, as action drivers in your communities to get things going. And so with that, without any further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Secretary Cardona to kick us off with his opening remarks. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Happy HBCU week. Uh, thank you for joining the virtual panel. Delighted to be here with Dr. Fauci uh, to discuss how HBCUs have navigated uh, the pandemic. Um, Dr. Webb, thank you for, for moderating it, but more importantly for the work you do, the important work you do across the country. Um, we know this year and a half has been like no other time in our, in our, in our lifetime. Um, and for our nation's youth, our families, our educators institution, it's still, we're still trying to make sense of it and adapt and continue to adapt. Um, we also know um, the pandemic didn't affect everyone equally, right? I still remember where I was standing when I heard the report last year when we were making decisions about reopening in Connecticut and I was serving as commissioner there. When I heard the news that black families were being impacted more and the mortality rate in black communities was greater, and I'm left with the decision on how to safely reopen schools. You know, so we know that that impact uh, is something that we have to contend with and we have to address uh, head on. Um, your response to this challenge has really moved and inspired me in many different ways. It's really impacted how others look at it too across the country. I've seen how you work not only to put clinics together, but to increase confidence in your communities so that people get the vaccine. Um, and I know you're going to continue to be leaders and resources for that those communities, especially now that we're seeing another increase in COVID cases. HBCUs are paving the path for institutions across the country to keep students on campus through vaccinations, making masks accessible and conducting frequent testing. Uh, it's really a confidence campaign as much as it is to make sure we're reducing transmission. Um, many of you have also joined the White House COVID-19 challenge, uh, and we're excited you're rolling up your sleeves to ensure your campuses are safe for the community. As we continue to battle this virus and the new variants, I know you'll continue to work to protect the health and safety of your campus and your communities. HBCUs, HBCUs have prioritized students in recovery efforts. You've used COVID recovery funds, the largest single federal investment, uh, to expand mental health services, clear students institutional debt, which allows them to re-enroll or continue their lives without the additional financial burden and provided educational materials at no additional cost to students. You've been an example everywhere about what it means to center, center on students in equity with the COVID 
higher education emergency relief dollars. I'm thrilled to join Dr. Fauci to discuss in real talk um, the work that we're doing on behalf of uh, addressing COVID-19 and to learn more about your recovery act. So thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Cardona. And you raised such an important point there. You talked about how at HBCUs people are really rolling up their sleeve. And, and that's not just uh, a small feat. It's a big deal. And right. it's not, it's something that, that I think in so many ways has shown leadership uh, all over the country. Other institutions have taken note. Uh, when we launched the, the college or the campus challenge where schools were signing up to be leaders and kind of encouraging students to register, HBCUs in a lot of states we're the first ones to raise their hands and say, we're here, we're gonna do this work. We're gonna make sure that we're securing the future and keeping our students safe. So such an important an important point. And I think that um, it really speaks to the leadership role HBCUs have played in communities. Uh, I wanna turn to Dr. Fauci really quickly to give your opening remarks under just a couple of minutes, uh, just kind of setting the stage for today's conversation. Dr. Fauci. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here with both Dr. Webb and Secretary Cardona and talk about this very important subject of the role of HBCUs in addressing really one of the most daunting challenges in the last 100 years when it comes to a global pandemic. You heard the secretary mention we're dealing with a very formidable Delta variant that is really quite different from what we have experienced as bad as the other variants were. The Delta variant has the extraordinary capability of transmitting highly efficiently from person to person. And thus what we really do need to do is to really implement and utilize the most extraordinary weapon that we have against this pandemic, and that's vaccines. And as the secretary said, and it is really a tragedy of our society that we have brown and black people who are not only more susceptible to getting infected on the basis of the jobs that they find themselves in, being frontline workers in society, but because of underlying conditions have a much greater likelihood that they would have a severe outcome. And this is very, very clearly and emphatically demonstrated in the higher rate of hospitalizations and deaths. So we need to mobilize the African-American community. And the best way to do that is to get people at the level of the uh, community, uh, the, the universities and colleges to be important leaders. You know, we often talk about trusted messengers. And if there ever was trusted messengers, is the younger people in the community to talk to their peers. If you look at vaccinations among African-Americans, it is lower than the general population. About 33% have received one dose and about 29% have actually been fully vaccinated. And young people, people from let's say 18 to 29, comprise about 22, 23% of all of the new infections. And something that's very sobering, just last week, a weekly total average on a daily basis was 160,000 new cases per day. That is extraordinary and we really do need to address that. So hopefully the conversation that we're gonna have in a minute or two will allow us to be able to galvanize each other and synergize to be able to get that message across of why it's so important, not only with vaccination, but with also physical distancing, mask wearing, and all of the other layered things that we do to prevent infection. So it's a great pleasure to be with you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. I know we've got about 25 minutes for the for the questions, so I want to get through as many as possible. But you just you spoke to the disproportionate impact of this pandemic on communities of color. There's an old saying in the black community that when America catches a cold, black people get pneumonia, right? It's the idea that there's just this heightened impact and effect, and that's really the confluence of the social determinants of health, the historic and contemporary wrongs that really drive and create these dynamics where we see disproportionate harm. And so I think we have to be really thoughtful about how we navigate those. And that takes me to the first question from Merlandi Mirabel, uh, an HBCU student scholar from Florida Memorial University, so down in South Florida, and, and really speaks to kind of the broader implications here. And, and her question is, you know, COVID-19 has, uh, and this is for Secretary Cardona, uh, COVID-19 has negatively impacted universities and most importantly, their resources, which may be considered the first domino to fall that can end in academic probation. And, and so the question is, how do you propose administrators go about allocating limited resources 
in addition to continuing to protect students against COVID-19? Right, um, you know, as you said, the, the issues compound themselves, right? And for HBCUs, there are, uh, in my opinion, a lot of those uh, foundational needs uh, issues, uh, such as uh, students coming from families that were more greatly impacted by the pandemic, maybe loss of life or, or job displacement, things like that. So the administrators of HBCUs have uh, that additional task of thinking, OK, how, how do we meet the basic needs and how are we addressing that while also maintaining uh, the academic success of our students? And let me just say this. Um, you know, I, I always say infrastructure is equity, right? But in this case, reopening is equity, ensuring that we can get our students back on campus safely, confidently is the first step. Um, you know, I understand the academic, uh, you know, fragility, if you will, based on just how they're dealing with, you know, Maslow's pyramid, taking care of the basics, and uh, it could lead to academic uh, peril for many of these students. But the first thing is to make sure that we're getting them back on campus, uh, make sure that we're doing that by promoting vaccination clinics, by having students hear from students about how it's safe and how it's how they're going to get back onto the school community because schools are communities. HBCUs are community. They're like second families. So having them uh, participate in those vaccination efforts um, to address what I what I call the relational divide that took place over the year and a half to make sure these students feel recommitted back to their schooling. And then once they're feeling comfortable there and they have some of those needs being met, which her the her funds could do help take care of some of those uh, basic needs we can worry about making sure their academic success gets back on track. Right now, you know, we have to think holistically of what our students experienced and how we can meet their basic needs and then support them academically. But also we need to be flexible with our grading policies. Um, you know, we have to look at um, just what we're doing to get them back on campus, making sure they feel reconnected to the school community. Um, and then the emergency COVID funding, which is intended to you know, reduce some of the, the costs that the students have uh, going to school. That should be helpful, but also the HER funds and the USDA and SNAP benefits that are available, the FCC um, broadband benefits that are available. Taking advantage of all of that, thinking holistically, uh, once the students feel connected, safe on campus, you can focus on the academic uh, acceleration. That, that's absolutely right. And I know that's part of your roadmap to success that you all have outlined. I was down in Florida last week with your team, Secretary Cardona, and one of the things we heard from students was the, the socio-emotional environment is so powerful. And there was one student who said, you know, her brother had COVID, her dad had COVID, and her grandfather had COVID all at the same time. And she said, my family is dying. And yeah. I have asking me about my grades. You know, it's really a hard dynamic and that disproportionate impact again falls on Music of color. So I love that you spoke to that very real dynamic of life happening in the midst of an education paradigm. It, it's really, you know, and, and, and just to be very brief here, we and I know HBCUs do this. I've seen this over the last six, seven months. We need to adapt to where the students are, not ask students to readapt and try to come back on campus the way things were. We have to really rethink of what do our students need now. Right now, the social, emotional, the basic needs need to be met, and then the academic acceleration will come. Perfect. Well, Dr. Fauci, you know, I've, I've done quite a few of these with you, and as per usual, I've got about eight questions in a row, so we're going to do some rapid fire. I know I know you can knock this out of the park. So so this is from uh, numerous students and different HCCU administrators, and, and they just want to hit some of the top line myths. So I'll just go at them and we'll, we'll take them one by one. First, can you speak to a couple of the details regarding the vaccine? Specifically, if somebody's had COVID, do they need the vaccine? The answer is yes, because even though COVID gives good protection following recovery, there have been a number of really good studies to show that if you get infected, recover and get vaccinated, you increase your level of protection dramatically above what just infection alone can do. In fact, it probably is the best form of protection really to get that extra boost that you get from getting vaccinated. So we do recommend that people who've recovered, that they do get vaccinated. And, and along those lines, you know, the vaccine, we're discussing this idea of boosters now, and that seems like it's on the horizon pretty soon. Will the COVID vaccine become commonplace, much like the flu vaccine? Well, I certainly don't know whether we're going to get it every single year when you say commonplace, Dr. Webb, but I can tell you 
it is a vaccine that we all have to get because we're dealing with a pandemic. Hopefully, the three shots of the mRNA and the two shots of J&J will have durable protection. It's very clear now from our data and the data in Israel that we do need that third shot in order to keep the durability and the intensity of the protection. And that's why we're planning to get it rolled out within a reasonable period of time. Definitely. The next question is, will we have to stay with the same vaccine, i.e., you know, Moderna or Pfizer, that we originally received? You know, I think the answer is likely going to be yes, because even though we have different variants, we find that when you get a good enough response against the prototype virus, which is the virus that was put into the original vaccine, that the protection that is elicited covers essentially all the variants, including the Delta variant. And we know that from experience, both in the in vitro study as well as clinically. Definitely. Uh, is, is it true that a vaccinated person could be infected with COVID-19 and still infect both vaccinated and unvaccinated people? The answer to that question is yes. That is referred to as a breakthrough infection. Since no vaccine is 100% protected, it is not surprising that you get breakthrough infections. The one thing we have observed is that when a vaccinated person gets a breakthrough infection, the likelihood is overwhelming that they would have a mild to moderate uh, clinical course as opposed to a severe course leading to hospitalization. So you may get infected, but for the most part, you're protected against severe disease. Okay, and, and how long will any of these vaccines, you know, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer and Moderna, remain effective against the variants? Well, that's why we're having the booster shots, because we're seeing in our own studies, the CDC cohort studies, and a number of studies in the UK and in Israel, that the durability, duration of protection wanes over a period of several months. And that's the reason why we're going to be implementing the booster program and hopefully that third shot of an mRNA and the second shot of a J&J &J will increase the level of protection, not only in its durability, but also in its intensity. Well, so again, you, you've kind of spoken to the vaccines being effective, but at the same time, there's still being some, some risk that remains. You know, if that's true, why are there restrictions on what unvaccinated people can do, including employment consequences uh, or not being able to enroll in school, but no similar restrictions on vaccinated people. If, if both vaccinated and unvaccinated people could still be infected. Well, the reason is, that's a very good question. And the reason is that if you look at the infection rate and the serious level of disease in vaccinated versus unvaccinated, overwhelmingly 90 plus percent of the serious infections are among individuals who are unvaccinated. And if you look at any outbreak, it is disproportionately by far among the unvaccinated. So even though you can have a breakthrough infection, it's an entirely different situation between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. All right, and last one, is frequent testing a substitute for the vaccine? No, that's an easy one. <laughs> Single answer, no. <laughs> testing has a good place, but you really need to get vaccinated. I can tell this isn't your first time answering questions like these, uh, Dr. Fauci, and, and I think it's helpful. You know, I think that these are the kinds of questions that that you know, students should be asking, that administrators should be asking, and that we're really here to answer because you know this is challenging. This is you know we called it the novel coronavirus, but that response that we've had is also new. The science is is rapidly evolving as science tends to do, and I think we try to keep people updated with the latest of what we know and what we don't know. But I think that at any point in time, you know, I always tell folks, don't don't operate off of stale information, right? If something, if you had some info from back in January or February, we're in we're in September now. This is, you know, there's so much that has changed since then, so it's important uh, to to keep that in mind. Yeah, here's a question from uh, from Chancellor Carrie Dixon from Elizabeth City State University, and this is to both of you. It says, uh, COVID-19 vaccination rates in communities of color continue to lag behind. Has the administration considered any strategies aimed at leveraging the community connections that HBCUs have to build trust among these communities of color? You know, we've seen HBCUs across the country really step up. As you mentioned before, the COVID-19 
vaccine challenge. Uh, HPU stood up first. We know, uh, we know as much as we know that the impact of COVID affects uh, black folks more, we know that the hesitancy uh, uh, is also greater in the black community. So what we've seen from the HBCUs is critical. Having vaccine clinics, using the HERF dollars to help uh, with efforts to mitigate the spread of the of virus, using trusted uh, folks from the community. I mentioned one of my best experiences as Secretary of Education was visiting Howard U, where they had their medical students um, who were lined up in their coats, giving vaccinations to members of the community. Talk about a sense of connection with the community and saying, hey, you can come to us, you know us, you trust us. So it's really important that um, we continue those efforts, that we lift those efforts, because it is going to take the, the sense of community that HBCUs provide in the broader community to get those numbers up. Um, we have to do more. This to me is an issue of equity and access for our, our black students. So, you know, I, I, I applaud and I'm inspired by the work of HBCUs up to this point, but I know we can, we're going to have to continue to do more uh, because this pandemic is, you know, this Delta variant is, is, is serious. And I'm going to say something based off the comments from the question before. We need to look at this Delta variant differently than the Alpha variant. When we talked about reopening schools last year, we were diff, diff, dealing with different transmission rates. We have to look at this one uniquely and really raise the bar when it comes to making sure folks understand the transmissibility of this. Um, we need to get our students back in school. HBCU and their efforts have really helped, and we want to continue to see that happen. Anything to add, Dr. Fauci? Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize one of the points that uh, Secretary Cardona made, and that is, you know, if there ever was trusted messengers, it's the young people in the African American community. If you want them to listen to their peers, you know, I had the opportunity a couple of months ago to go down in Anacostia. Uh, section of Washington with Mayor Bowser to try and get people convinced. But were th there were a bunch of students from, from Howard. And I could tell you, if I were a young African-American in Anacostia and Tony Fauci versus a Howard student <laughs> said get vaccinated, I would listen to the Howard student. <laughs> right. right. Well, I think it, it speaks to the power of that peer-to-peer -peer dynamic, especially when it's equipped with good information. And, uh, and that's the thing, you have to be ready and, and prepared to, to answer those tough questions. And it, it's really critical that we do. You know, I'll add, you know, from the White House COVID-19 response team, you know, I work closely with uh, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith and we lead a lot of the equity work and HBCUs have been involved since the very beginning. We met with the HBCU Leadership Forum early on. Uh, we've connected with the, the four historically black medical universities. So Meharry, Morehouse, Howard, and Drew, and, and really talk to them about what they're doing to lead. They actually co-authored an op-ed vaccines to their students with Morehouse and Howard had over 90% of their students already vaccinated. And so when you are seeing HBCUs use their voice and use their leadership, use their values in protecting the future of black leaders and community um, to really help drive the efforts as well. And so we we definitely do uh, continue to, to, to stay close there. But Chancellor Dixon, if if you have any other suggestions for us, we're, we're always here for them. You know, I think that's also what this is. We're learning from you all and building based off some of the great ideas that come from community. So thanks for the question. Um, we've got one, uh, again, this is one to both of you. Uh, and this also comes from numerous students and administrators at HBCUs. It says, what can the federal government do to mandate mask usage on campuses and vaccine requirements, particularly in states that may have prohibitions against these efforts? And, and I know Secretary Cardona, you, you've uh, taken a real leadership role on this. You know, what can the government do uh, to both do the mitigation measures and the vaccination efforts. You know, <laughs> this is called real talk, right? So for me, it, it's frustrating that um, in some places politics got in the way and it's hurting our black and brown communities more because uh, not only do we know that the impact of COVID on them is greater, but we also know that the lack of confidence uh, in returning to school or colleges is greater as well. So when we put poor policies in place, we're just uh, increasing the lack of confidence that they have in these institutions. So lead with the science, uh, lean on science, establish structures where we have uh, school and, and college leaders uh, working closely. My, the, the state epidemiologist in Connecticut was my best friend last year, and we worked really closely to make sure that 
when it was appropriate doing right now we had calls with the health officials on the call communicating the health science and helping allay the fears and create a pathway uh, to, to school reopening so we're going to lean very heavily on the science now the federal government the department of education does not mandate masks we do not mandate vaccines what we do is we put a spotlight on where it's working we also make sure that we're protecting the rights of students who are not having access uh, so we recently use the Office for Civil Rights to investigate cases that were brought to us uh, where students with disabilities weren't having access because of poor policies. And these are students that were more susceptible to the impact of the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 and, and um, their health, uh, they might have health issues. So we're really pushing where we need to push to make sure that we follow the science, follow the mask mandates where they're needed to safely return to school. As I said before, reopening is about equity for me, and that's why we're pushing really hard. Dr. Fauci, any thoughts on the mask yeah. mandate and what we can do? Well, actually, I think we start, we, we've we seen the, the potential role of the federal government right from the president himself, who has said very, very clearly regarding the, you know, uh, local officials at the state and city level interfering with the implementation of a mask mandate. The president has been very, very clear about that says if you're not going to help us with this, just get out of the way. And that's what I really think is important. So uh, and I just want to repeat that because he has said that many times. Definitely. Well, you know, thanks for the great questions that we received there. I know we're coming to the to the end of the program, so I want to give each of you and we'll start with Secretary Cardona uh, just a, a minute or so for some closing remarks uh, for this session. Yeah, to all the leaders that are listening, um, what we're doing today is critically important. And I encourage you to continue to do this. Um, you know, I appreciate Dr. Fauci and Dr. Webb, your, what you're doing to help safely reopen schools, putting the right information out there, being very clear, being very forthright um, to the leaders that are uh, doing the work of reopening schools. This is like, unlike any other time in leadership. But I said before, the pandemic strengthened uh, our resolve and sharpened our sword for the real fight ahead, addressing inequities. We're in this together. Let's maintain a level of urgency to make sure we're building back better, using every resource uh, we can to help provide better access for our students and success in, in our schools. We're committed at the Department of Education to working with you, to uh, locking arms with you and, and helping our HBCUs thrive. So thank you for what you're doing and continued success. Dr. Patsy. Well, thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure to participate in this program with Secretary Cardona and Dr. Webb, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the important role of historically black colleges and universities have in our ability and our capability of putting an end to this outbreak for so many reasons. It's just uh, so important to have young people, uh, people who have passion, people who have energy to get out there and help us tackle what, as I said before, is historically one of the worst and most important challenges from a public health standpoint that we've had in over 100 years, that historically black colleges and university will and are playing a major role in helping us to address that. Thank you. Awesome. You know, I have to acknowledge for Secretary Cardona at Lincoln University, you know, we're talking about HBCUs, truly the history makers, and everybody always thinks about, uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall and Langston Hughes and kind of driving that history, but you also have, you know, children of uh, Lincoln alumni like Cab Calloway, like Paul Robeson, you know, other folks who've gone on to do incredible things who are tied to that legacy. Uh, and, you know, for myself, my parents are Southern Jaguars. My brother's a, uh, you know, Hampton grad. My sister's a Howard grad. We are all connected in some way to the greatness of HBCUs. And this is a absolutely notable moment in history. So for institutions known for being history makers, this is a critical time for you to use that, that well-developed muscle of making history to help our communities break through and make sure that we not only survive, but thrive through this critical juncture. I wanna thank you all for joining today's conversation and uh, for being a part of this. I wanna encourage you to continue to participate in HBCU Week. There are so many important conversations to be had. We need your voices, we need your leadership, we need your vision as we move forward. Uh, again, thank you for joining us and you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thank you.